Hey everybody, I'm Ryo Yamaguchi, the publicist at Copper Canyon Press, and you are watching season three of our interview series, Line Break, which goes off the page and into the homes and minds of our beloved poets. We began Line Break as a way to connect during the pandemic, and we've had so much fun seeing poets on screen, hearing poems, talking about writing, books, life, that we simply had to keep this series going. Thank you for tuning in. We have such an exciting, multifaceted conversation ahead of us today, Paisley Rectal, who will be publishing this extraordinary hybrid work with us, so big in its scope, in its title, West. And yet, like so much of Paisley's work, it is profoundly grounded in this really tactile sense of poetry and of language and of all of these lives that she writes about. I am so eager to talk about the creative processes behind this, but before I do, first, Paisley, hello. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. I'm so excited to be here. Thanks. Thanks very much. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, so we're recording this in December. And, um, you know, it's a time I'm thinking a lot about the year coming to a close. And I would expect that this is an especially transitional time for you, uh, given all your responsibilities as an academic. And I just kind of want to ask, just kind of get us going here, uh, just how the term is wrapping up for you, uh, for you and your students and your colleagues. And uh, actually, it's really good. This is probably one of the few semesters I can say that about, mostly because uh, we were actually able to be in person the entire semester, and um, only uh, only two students got sick <laughs> towards the end of it. So I feel like that's just its own triumph at this point. You know, they were, were we able to keep meeting in person, and and did did no one have to be quarantined for very long? So yeah, that's about it. That's as good as it gets at this point. <laughs> No, absolutely. I mean, and that's a that's a little bit kind of underlying my question is that I feel like this is the first semester where I think reliably everyone's in person, you know, on campus. And if and if the vibe has been good for that, I mean, it sounds like it has been. I mean, yeah, yeah it's been fun. It's been fun. to. It's just so much of a relief to be back in the classroom consistently. I just really enjoy it. I love teaching. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I know I've been thinking we were just right before the call, we were talking about AWP and getting kind of excited for it and thinking about, I mean, this will probably be for, I mean, for us, it'll be the first time back to that conference um, and, and all of its splendor. And I think, of, I think about this a lot with, you know, we both live in the West um, and, and also in these kind of high desert areas that are so feel so devoid. Sometimes I was out on this hike um, this week uh, with the sun, sun was setting and um, and it felt, you know, just felt very open and, and, and mostly unpopulated. And then right as the sun was setting, just this insane murder of crows, this flock of crows, like just to start flitting among all the junipers. And I was kind of reminded how much life there is here in these landscapes. Like, um, and I think that's something that this, that this book really does, you know, Wes does um, so much is it just shows how much life is here in all these different kind of forms, you know? Um, and I don't know, I don't know. I'm just like really, really sort of grateful for that. Um, do you, do you have like, yeah, I mean, do you do you have any rituals for this time of year at all? Like, as for New Year or or for the holidays and that kind of thing? Yeah. No, I really wish I did. Um, you know, it's funny because I'm trying to I'm trying to actually create more rituals. I'm trying to create some sense of um, just some sort of more of a connection, um, just with time and 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 place and stuff like that. And this isn't a ritual at all, but um, for the last several years, because I was um, Utah's poet laureate, so I was really busy. <laughs> I didn't get to go skiing nearly as much as I'd wanted to, and so um, I got a pair of backcountry skis. And so I'm 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 doing that <laughs> not very well, but you know I'm trying to get back into skiing and back into you know like one to two days a week, just get out there and um, be out in this this incredible landscape because. You know, I think a lot of people know that the West is beautiful, but there's it's another thing to be in it and the wildness of it and um, the openness of it. And, you know, to to be uh, constantly reminded of place is sort of a privilege, because I think having lived in cities for so many years of my life and I still live in a city, but you 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 think of nature as as behaving around you and you you know get to do your life and somehow there's natural stuff but it it's nice to be in a place where you're really aware of the landscape and you're really aware of your impact on the environment and 
Um, that's one thing I just love about um, the West. And, and it was something I was thinking about with the book a little bit too, you know, even though it's, I'm writing about the train and the transcontinental railroad and people and thinking about that kind of impact, I wanted to think about environmental impacts as well. And so I actually have a poem about, you know, um, the sequoias um, that were made into tracks. And I spent a lot of time thinking about the West Desert too, and writing about um, Robert Smithson and the spiral jetty and thinking about his ideas of land art and how they actually are really fascinating commentaries on American history itself. So I'm, I'm always aware of land, I guess. That's a long way of getting into a completely different place in which you started with. <laughs> No, that's so, that's so, um, it's so interesting. I mean, you're, you're touching on really already kind of fascinating points, I think. Um, uh, I, I mean, one thing is you're saying that I, I was spending time with both, both of those, so I mean, with the whole book today um, in advance of this and thinking about the spiral jetty. And one thing I really like that you relate, this is maybe in the notes of it, but that it's no one really owns it. Like, I mean, the Dia Foundation is a steward of it. And that's in really stark, incredible contrast to another thing that you note, which is this kind of the easement that surrounds the track, like 10 miles on either side of the railroad tracks and how that is owned. That is a space that that maybe shouldn't be owned. And, and thinking of the sequoias as being owned now in these, you know, in this functional yeah. kind of form, like, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it is fascinating to think about ownership in the West and the land. I mean, this is a landscape that I think, I mean, from, you, you know, before white settlers and white, you know, colonial settlers came through, you had a sense of land is not owned, but moved through, you know, people, people had winter encampments, people had spring encampments, people had large territories, uh, sort of national boundaries, but they were also understood as sort of shared boundaries as well, that they were something very porous. And there was a much more um, open and communal and certainly less possessive ideas of landscape um, until suddenly landscape became claimed, you know, quote unquote, by white settlers. And then it was like, well, no, this was our land. And, and people, are about it. And, and I found that really fascinating to think about when writing about West is thinking about how, um, you know, the train becomes a way of sort of facilitating certain types of ownership in the West. And the ways that art always is a great way of reminding us that in fact, we don't own, we don't, um, we don't necessarily possess in these kinds of ways and not in ways that we think we do. So yeah, that's, that was something that Robert Smith and I have, Smith and I have to admit was not somebody who had personally interested me that much until I started doing research on this book. And I was thinking, wow, that, that is a really fascinating commentary. Like he builds a spiral jetty very close to where the golden spike promontory, you know, meeting place, the X of completion, you know, is made, um, you know, on promontory summit where the two railroad halves sort of unite. And it's all about, you know, forward progress. It's all about industrialization and modernity and all this sort of stuff. And then Smithson is like, you know, I'm just going to create this spiral that would suggest that, in fact, everything you think about progress, progression and everything you think about ownership and everything you think about completion actually comes and spirals out and, and works towards entropy and it decays. And I love that. I love the fact that there's that sly comment out there in the West Desert. Yeah. No, that's wonderful. And you do such a good job at pointing that out. I mean, exactly as you just described and in your notes where you have a railroad, which is so linear, it's about progression, you know, and then this, and this jetty, which is so resistant to that spiraling yeah. back return, um, going nowhere, you know, kind of going thing. Nowhere. Yeah. which is what I felt like when I was writing this book. I mean, to be honest, I, I I'd love to hear from other writers, but I suspect all of us uh, are in the exact same boat where you, I mean, I, it's the rare writer who knows where they're going. I think all of us kind of just kind of waddle around yeah. in our in the in the in the region of unknowing and then suddenly you, you have a book and you're like oh that's what it's about and then you clean it all up and like see I planned this whole thing to begin with <laughs> <laughs> but in fact you had no idea yeah. that's that's so wonderful yeah I mean I love this uh I always think of um I've I've had conversations about the revision process as like a form of forensics or as a form of like self-analysis where it's you you're returning to your own self to yeah. understand it through through line edits, you know, and stuff. Um, yeah, bad therapy is what is it's, it, yeah. <laughs> it's like. <laughs> right. It's like the world's so like, come to Jesus therapy. Yeah. Oh, well, but, but bad in a good way, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, that Well, I really want to talk about non-linearity in particular with reference to the website. Um, but So let's maybe, but let's just kind of hold that thought maybe for a second. Yeah. We'll, we'll put it to the side because um, I do absolutely want to get to that. 
um, talking about uh, I I can't okay I can't resist if we're talking about Spiral Jetty if you know the if you know the, the work of the sculptor Andy Goldsworthy yes um, yes yeah. another you know I love those sort of pieces that he would do and sort of leave for people to find and and again this idea of decay like yeah it it's not meant to be permanent it's just yeah. not yeah. It, like I love, I mean, in, in, there's a great documentary from called Rivers and Tides, I think, or something. And he's building these cairns in 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 tidal, you know, the tides coming in, and just watching these cairns just get swept over with the water. I mean, it's just extraordinary. I know right? exactly yeah. what you're talking about. I watched yeah. it too, and and actually, that really, you know, I'll I'll jump to the website in one moment, you know, theoretically with that because yeah. I'm just pouring tea for myself and so yeah. not just. But the thing that <laughs> really interested me about you know, Goldsworthy's work is that um, the embrace of impermanence and, you know, working on West, the website, which is a digital artifact, um, we might have an imagina imagination that in some ways like a more enduring kind of um, artifact, a material. And in, in many ways, it's not because so many digital projects rely on platforms that themselves become either outdated or like if you've got Flash, for instance, yeah. like it's gone. And there are <laughs> websites, I was talking maybe to you as well about this, like there's a wonderful website called 88 Constellations for Wittgenstein. It's an amazing art piece, yeah. just fantastic. And you can't watch it anymore. The site, which is a true genius piece of art is unplayable because of the la you know, Flash is gone. And, and I kind of like that. I mean, I, when I was writing about the transcontinental, again, the sort of, the idea is an enduring empire that is built on an indust industrial infrastructure that is always about, um, you know, technological progress. And the reality of the transcontinental is it's always being built. As soon as it was built, it degrades and you have to go back and you have to rebuild it. And websites are a bit like that. And the funny thing is like books, you know, we think of this as probably, <laughs> like the lowest end technology, but it's the most enduring technology. It's the easiest <laughs> to sort of, you know, like worms will get to it, moths will get to it, that sort of thing. But um, generally speaking, it, it'll it last longer than a website will. Um, it'll hold up. <laughs> it'll retain its beauty in ways that the digital doesn't. And yeah. I had, going back to Gold's really, I was like, I like the idea that at some point, West, the website will be unplayable, that mm. it will degrade and it will be unrecoverable. And that to me is like a private joke, which is sort of like, here's the transcontinental that I built and it was meant to just go to dust. Yeah. So. Yeah. yeah. Oh, it's, it's incredible. I, uh, I, I, and I remember very vividly that we, that our, our wonderful coffee that we had for so long at Iconica here in Santa Fe, um, when, when you were in town for the conference, um, talking about flash going away. And I remember that too. And, and there were also other art web, web art pieces I knew about that were, you know, gone. Mm -hmm. uh, the Wittgenstein piece is so so incredible, um, and I love the idea of the durability of paper. I mean, I'm thinking of like papyri and things, you know, from yes. from Mesopotamians or whatever, um, and like this is still around, you know, in fragments. Um, exactly. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, this of course there's also train, and the name of the train wreck is escaping me. That's that's in in West too, but the Bagley train wreck. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. This idea of like iron being taken over by the by the landscape and you know d d uh, turning into sand i think as you as you mentioned it like um, yeah it's just, like, so yeah and it is funny because when you go past it like i think i'd seen it by accident a couple of times i've i've driven around the dead transcontinental line the sort of ghost town area where the old transcontinental used to go and you go past it and you don't even notice it necessarily and then you get up yeah. there and there's actually a tremendous amount of wreckage left there like the union pacific yeah. After a while, they were just like, oh, hell with it. You know, we don't have this material. We don't want to drag any of it out. So you can find a lot of stuff out there. And it's just, you know, web or, you know, orb weavers have built webs in it. Pelicans have nests in it. Owls have nests in it. You know, it's degrading. It's literally becoming part of the website. And it's funny because, you know, here's this thing that is supposed to stand outside of nature, but it's becoming part of nature. Whereas a spiral jetty, which is supposed to be like a comment on nature in some ways, like you go there and people, there's tons of people always taking pictures of it. So it becomes like this piece of art um, in some ways stands outside of the natural environment that it was supposed to be really naturally part of. It's, it's, it's kind of a surprising flip. So, it's, yeah. 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 Um, I mean, and I hear in this, uh, I hear in this too, this kind of idea of uh, the museumification of art, or we have anything that's really old, we want to put in a glass case and handle with gloves. And, but when you get 
there's certain examples in the world where that just isn't that case. You know, this train wreck is just out there in the landscape. The jetties can't be can't contained. I, I think of experiences of walking around India and going and just there'll just be a Jain temple like yeah. oh, it, like a thousand years old. And yes. there's no there's no red ropes or there's nothing. You could just walk up and touch it. I mean, it's, you know, um, yeah. So. Yeah, I'm glad you bring this up, too. You know, I'm, you know, the museumification and the idea of preservation and what it is. And it's true, like if you go into other cultures, like in Southeast Asia, where I lived for a while and you travel around, you can end up in these incredible you know, complexes of temples. And some of them are well known like Angkor Wat and others are not. And they're just far off the beaten track and you just go through and there's no attempt to sort of make it safe for tourists. You know, there's no ramps built. There's no, there's nothing out there. There's no ropes, there's nothing. And um, you just sort of encounter it in its degrading state. And, um, and there's something amazing about that because you know, preservation, the ways that, it, and it comes out of a place of like, history is important. And, you know, all of these things are important, but the reality is that loss is always there. And that, you know, going back to West for a minute, that was the thing that haunted me so much about the project, which is that when I was asked to write a poem about the transcontinental railroad, you know, being biracial, being half Chinese, I thought this is a perfect way to go in and tell those histories that have that are that have always been there, but no one's paying attention to I'll start with these, you know, Chinese workers, but what I encountered immediately was loss. We don't have any letters, we have no diaries, we have nothing written from these workers, we have no, we don't even really have their names. And so we know of their presence because they left other material records. Like if you go along the transcontinental and you go to these sort of Chinese camps, which you can do right now, you'll find artifacts that are just left there. So you feel their presence, but there's this incredible void as well. Um, and at the same time, like if you are in the West and you see other Chinese people here who've been here for generations, you're seeing that presence again because a lot of them have come, um, you know, as transcontinental workers, you know, married, settled, you know, raised families, open businesses and stuff like that. So, you know, you're constantly wrestling, like, what are we trying to preserve when we, when we run into these temples and we run into these things? Like, what is the thing that we think we have to preserve? Because in some ways, all around us is preservation. Those temples still exist, um, just not in the state that we want them to exist potentially. And these people exist that I'm writing about but maybe not in the ways that we want to first encounter them in a poem or in a history book. And so I just, I'm really kind of haunted by that. Like, what is, what does it mean for something to be truly lost? And then in its recovery, like what exactly are we recovering? A, another kind of fantasy, which would require another kind of loss, or are we recovering something completely different um, in our imagination, in our stitching together all that these different kinds of facts and artifacts that we can find? Um, have we created something entirely new? Um, in which case it's not recovery at all. It's just, it's just fabrication. So I don't know, that's, <laughs> I, but I'm fascinated by that question, like preservation and loss and, and where do those things touch and where do those things pull apart? That's yeah. Oh man, that's such a that's such a complex and rich topic. And I think also where we are in history is so important because we we us as humans at this moment in history are so tasked with this idea of recovery and of and you know I mean if I'm hearing the word imperialism in here that, that that recovery has an imperial quality to it or that we only do things you know we 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 can never escape our own need for the utility of what we decide to remember um, yes. and, and and that kind of thing. Um, you, and you and you're bringing up actually my very first question about West, um, which has to do with the invisibility of the person who wrote this poem, um, and and to to invoke Derrida, the trace of them, you know, and but before maybe this, okay maybe let's hear a poem actually let's let's concretize this a little bit if, yeah. if you're if you're game to uh, read a poem if you think um, yeah yeah and then we want to show the website too this could be a good time or whenever you think but um, yeah yeah I'll show I'll show the website and it'll be a poem it's me reading a poem and this actually speaks to one of the problems of maybe. <laughs> <laughs> um, fantasy fabrication loss. One of the things, um, and I, I'll explain how to use the website later on, but so this poem, this Chinese poem here uh, on the screen 
is uh, a poem that was carved into the walls of Angel Island Immigration Station sometime during the Chinese Exclusion Act, which is a very long time. It's between 1888 and 1943. So we don't even know what date. We don't know who wrote it. We do know that it's part of a what they call a dialogic pair of poems that elegize a suicide. Um, a, another Chinese migrant had committed suicide while in detention in, um, in Angel Island. And that was not uncommon. Uh, but nor was it uncommon for people to carve poems into the walls to sort of record their feelings, their impressions, their hopes, their dreams, and stuff like that. But we don't know anything about these people. We can make us educated guesses, which is that anyone who's writing in this kind of poem style, it's called regulated verse, the closest approximation in, in English is the sonnet. And he was writing like this was probably pretty well educated. Um, and probably a man then, because women did not tend to get that kind of education. Um, and this is every single, this website, every single character or pair of characters opens up into a poem about the transcontinental. And this is one uh, called What Day? And the important thing to know about this is that I wanted to write from the perspective of, you know, some Chinese workers um, again, not having their voices that they wrote down about their experiences, I had to imagine it. And the other thing I was thinking about is I wanted to think about the transcontinental in a sort of fractal way, think about all the different people who worked on the railroad. And the thing that really struck me again about um, the scholarship around the transcontinental is another absence, which is no one really talked about um, queer histories of the railroad. So I'm gonna play this. And I'll put on the closed captioning too, so that people can see that. What day? On this seventh day of the seventh month, magpies bridge in a cluster of black and white. The Sky King crosses to meet his queen, time tracked by the close-knit wheeling of stars. I watch. You come to me tonight, drunk on wine and cards, nails ridged black with opium to ease the pain of work. We are all men here. Anybody can be a bridge, little raven. Your eyes squeezed shut, but not from pain. We are a trestle, a grade we build together. What matter if you say you'd never choose me, were there women willing in this desert? I chose. I choose the memory we share of rivers, your hair of smoke and raw, wet leather. A man in another man's hand makes himself tool or weapon, says the overseer, as if a man's use to another is only one of work. Pleasure is the only chosen future. You are the home I briefly make, the country I can return to. Here, where the moon wheels its white shoulder in the dark, and you push me to the earth, slip my whiskered tip of hair into your mouth. So, um, I just want to say I played that for Utah's governor and like a whole room of very conservative um, donors. <laughs> and um, that was one of the greater pleasures I had as Utah's poet laureate. Um, and they loved it. I have to say they, they, th they thought it was great, or at least they told me to my, that to my face. But one of the things I wanted to do in that poem was um, pick up on two themes that I talk about in the book. One of the things that struck me so much in writing and reading um, about the transcontinental is in the 19th century, they really saw the train as body. They kept talking about the iron joins and joints, you know, the an iron nervous system. I mean, they really made the railroad a physical embodiment. And so when we were making this video, I wanted, I wanted bodies and railroad parts to sort of merge together, but to subvert it slightly because oftentimes when they were thinking about that 
you know, bodily reality or bodily, you know, presence of the railroad, they saw it as a form of assimilation. How can we make these people from other nations who are working on a railroad Americans? And if you notice in the poem, the character says, you know, you are the home I briefly make the country I can return to. Like, and the labor of building that railroad isn't about becoming more American, but actually becoming Chinese again, in a way, it becomes an, a moment of connecting back to the other country that he plans to go back to. Um, and also, you know, I was thinking about how much labor is used to people's detriments. Like you read about the transcontinental, the Chinese died. We don't know how many, but many, many um, men died building that railroad because they were given the most physically difficult tasks. And they were really blasting through the Sierras with nitroglycerin um, and, you know, crawling up these, you know, carapaces of stone without, you know, anything but like a tiny piece of rope. People were dying. Um, this was painful, painful labor. And if you go out to the transcontinental and you see just how monumental it was, you just know like this was this was kind of endurance and suffering. So I wanted, you know, the idea of sexual intimacy to be a kind of, um, this is a physical labor of pleasure that you cannot take away from me. This is a way of standing kind of against the way that my labor, labor has been used against me. Um, and so I, th I thought it was really, you know, you know, it's not just sort of a titillating poem for me. To me, it's like a, a, po a poem that, for me, I'm hoping it's a kind of useful site of resistance because I want people to sort of see like there are ways in which these men were able to use and imagine their bodies that was controlled only by them, you know, not by somebody else. I um, that's so. It's everything you're saying is so so incredible, and I'm thinking of this 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 multiplicity of bodies, and um, I love this idea of of pleasure as almost uh um as 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 almost an act of defiance you know yeah. um I, I think it's so well done in the in this in this video too i mean I, i'm very taken with texture in the video um in the way that that's described and skin you know and there's the the uh well i just learned this word so i'm going to use it the crackalore of um of this uh of broken dry skin and of the desert as it's fragmenting and then this like very velvety sensuous skin that's that's there and, and how all of that's coming together through these cross dissolves and, and through these double exposures that's happening in the um in in the film you know um it's yeah there's something there's something very surface that's bringing together these dichotomies like you're saying um that's that's so wonderful that uh, i'm an american but i'm chinese i'm home but i'm away i'm you know pain and pleasure and um how important all of those are to each other you know okay so so this goes back to the, the invisibility of this prisoner on angel island and this trace this poem that's been left behind and all of these stories that have been left behind and, and unsung and unseen um and i think so much of the power of this project is in giving shape and, and in particular illumination and i think illumination is a really um key term here um to, to the forgotten communities in the west um what do you think in your mind just top of mind what's the most egregious oversight our history of the west has has held on to I um, mean, you know, is there if there's like one takeaway you'd hope readers would have um, from this project, like what would it be? That is a great question. And I mean, I know I'm asking you to, to identify <laughs> one among many things. Yeah, but yeah. no, I, I think my my first impulse, and I write about this in the book a little bit, or I guess I guess my first impulse to answer that question is to sort of say not who is forgotten because one could make a really strong case that you know every group there's just not enough information on but i think what really struck me in my research was um maybe the ways in which we are not creative in how we remember um so i talk about this in some of the notes the note essay where um one of the questions was sort of like that kept coming up in my mind as I was researching is sort of like, what did Chinese and native peoples think of each other? And there's not a lot of scholarship on that. There's some, but not a ton. And where I, what I was able to find via some footnotes and like one tiny article that really fully addressed it was um, that in fact, it's in oral histories of the Paiute and the Goshute and the Shoshone where they intermarried and they adopted Chinese workers sometimes into their families. And certain Chinese workers uh, also adopted some of the native customs or languages and memorized um, the stories. Like, so for instance, there was one 
man named Sam Wong, evidently, or no, not Sam Wong, somebody else who, who um, memorized, I guess, all of the stories that he could of the Paiute. And when he died, the Paiute and the Ute went to mourn him at the Indian agent's office. And I think that that's what we forget. We forget that actually it's how we remember each other. Um, we don't necessarily, we, we, we look for official histories. We look for written documents. That's what we tend to look for. And I understand why I did too, um, because it's the easiest thing to cite. It's the easiest sort of evidence you have. But most of the memories of the West are exactly that. They are memories, they're held in oral culture. They are held in family lore. They are held in some ways, just like essentially very close to the body because they're in our minds and they're in our, our retellings and private encounters. And I think that that's the thing that is the biggest um, absence in the West is that maybe we, you know, when we've got uh, a space and a time frame in which written records were hard to get or preserve or to make, maybe we need to start asking better questions about where to look and who to talk to and how to remember cross culturally. That's so, I love in particular that cross-cultural element of this and, and the way you're described. I mean, I think we're in a, I think we're in a moment right now um, where we are trying to recover lost histories. We're trying to give illumination to histories that we've refused to look at. And I, but I think one tendency that we have sometimes in that is to compartmentalize those histories, to, to try and hold them pristine, to say like, this is, this is an intact you know, um, version of things um, when when really kind of like you're describing, like, no, I mean, cultures are constantly in communication with each other. They're corrupting each other yeah. um, in these beautiful and creative ways. Um, and sometimes that's and sometimes that's there's a distinct power dynamic to that, too. It's not there's no there's not parity to it. And yet, nonetheless, it's this interaction like, um, yeah, I thought about that a lot because, you know, there's it did not. <laughs> it did not escape me that having written a book called Appropriate, a Provocation, all about cultural appropriation and literature, yeah. I was now working on a book that was entirely appropriative in its, in its, you know, aesthetic strategies. And, you know, of course, I'm writing about, um, you know, the transcontinental, which is not only an extractive kind of labor and industry, but it's also appropriative in the ways that it takes as other people's labor, didn't often pay some of the workers that, you know, worked on the railroad, um, and has sort of subsumed all of these histories in a way that just sort of, you know, raises up, you know, people like, you know, Leland Stanford or Charles Crocker or General, you know, Dodge, who ran the Union Pacific, like, we know so much about the people who benefited from the building of the transcontinental. We know nothing pretty much about the people who built it. And so going in and, you know, working with these kinds of documents and these materials and thinking about, you know, experiences that are completely different than mine, it's not certainly as bad as what the Union Pacific did or as monumental as what the Union Pacific did, but it's of a scale. Like there's, there's a kind of relationship, which is, you know, obviously I'm I'm building a book that relies in some ways on the, the labor of other people, the language of other people. And, you know, I talk about that also in the book and this note, I was really struck by the work of Christina Rivera Garza. And she was talking about the value of appropriation as a way of sort of using the archive to speak back to certain institutions that would take these kinds of um, bodies and materials and labor for their own benefit. But she did point out something that I point out in the book too, which is who is it that really wrote this book? You know, I like to think of myself as the writer of the book, but the reality is it could not have existed without all of the different archival sources that I used, all the different texts that I, um, you know, work with and play with, you know, the collages that I, you know, scatter throughout. That's from a book, uh, you know, of maps and stuff like that. So literally the production of this book was done by other people. If anything, I'm sort of the conductor or the orchestrator of the thing. Um, so it's, a, you know, for me, I have to admit, it's a very strange process to talk about and represent a book that I think of is really um, polyvocal and uh, polyauthored. Actually, um, it doesn't it doesn't feel like me as the writer a lot of times. And you know, I've I've both liked and got been a little afraid of these poems because usually when I write a poem, it's going to sound like me. And I went out of my way to make sure these poems do not sound like me. Um, mostly. <laughs> um, the one I just played for you is the closest that sounds like me because I'm, you know, that's the one I had to make up my, my the language for. 
but everything else pretty much takes its language from somebody else. And so how to be, you know, respectfully, pres you know, preserving of that at the same time, understanding it can't really be me. <laughs> it's, it's strange. Um, no, this is a, a, a terrific dynamic that you're that you're talking about, and um, and this and, and the idea. I mean, it's it's tricky terrain to the idea of appropriation, or or, or a bit of, a better term maybe is just found found text or found yeah. you know, material. Let's, use like, that. Okay. <laughs> Let's well, go with that. <laughs> I, th I think you're. I mean, I think you, I think the approach is right, though. I mean, that it's you're very democratic. I mean, it's everyone's. Po I mean, you you know, I mean, uh, you know, unsung voices, but then also you know Abraham Lincoln. Like, I mean, it's, you know, I mean, it's it's everyone. I mean, and I, th and I think you put them all into conversation. Um, you're touching on something that. And I'm, I'm hesitant almost to ask this question because um, because you're already sort of talking so well about it, but but you're 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 echoing um, our our absolutely fabulous intern Toby, um, who has been writing these ex like spectacularly sensitive, well-read questions, and so he kind of asked a question about this, exactly what you're describing, um, and and I'm hoping this question may, maybe can kind of expand this a little bit. So let me, if you don't mind, I'm just going to ask this verbatim, um, and it goes like this: So West paints such a diverse yet coherent picture of the lives that America has built itself and its progress over. I love that yeah. line, that America has built itself and its progress over. In revivifying these lives, how did you see your voice interacting with the voices of the archive? Um, where did you want your choices as a poet to be more pronounced or less visible? So I think he's asking you for a little bit more detail on how you how you really did see yourself, I mean, as your as a person within this. I mean, you're the conductor, you're the researcher, um, but surely you have your own personal stake, oh, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I definitely have my own personal stake. I mean, I I think anyone can sort of see some part of how I felt about the transcontinental. I mean, I take a very critical approach to it, largely, largely because I think you know, the transcontinental deserves that critical approach, but also because there's been so much uh, positive literature essentially written about it. You know, it, it can it can sustain a little bad press, um, the transcontinental. But in terms of how I saw my own voice working within these, um, I wanted to, it's a hard question to answer because there's like sort of three ways I thought about it. So when I'm dealing with texts um, by people we don't know anything about. So like the African-American porters who worked on the railroad um, during the mid, you know, mid part of the 20th century. These are people who left no other written record that I know of, um, and they don't have a, a volume of work that stands on their own. And so I wanted to be as close to them as possible. So I, I had a very particular working ethic. You know, No one has a verbal tick that they did not display in that record. No one says something they did not effectively say in that record. Um, I pared down quite a bit to bring out the music of their voices, to make sure that the rhythms of the speech that attracted me first to their stories was preserved as best I could, but with an understanding that a lot was cut out, a lot. Um, but with those, you know, like Frederick Law Olmsted or, you know, Robert Louis Stevenson, whose voices I appropriate, there's a huge amount of, you know, record from them. So I was able to be a lot freer. But again, it was also, our, our, you know, identifying what it is that they were saying, the particular rhythms of their speech, but then also being able to sort of say, you know, what is it that they're implicating, indicating or suggesting, but not really saying explicitly? And can I elevate that? And that's where my voice stitches in. And I'm like, I'm going to, I'm going to be, I'm going to make a little more obvious what they refuse to say. <laughs> so that, you know, Olmsted, for example, he's writing in the Southern Railroads and he's making comments about mixed race people. And for him, it's kind of, it's clear from our vantage point, he doesn't think of it as racist. He and people at the time probably would not have considered it racist, but standing where I'm standing, the ways he's looking at biracial people was racist. And I think it was important to bring that out, like the sort of anxiety of mixing. And that gets to the third thing that, you know, I wanted to bring out in this, you know, the transcontinental unites East and West. And it was imagined as a bodily reality. And it was a place in which different classes, different ra races, different nations, different genders, sexualities mixed because it was a public space. 
And what came up over and over and over in my research was the sort of horror of that. You know, that was like, the transcontinental is awesome because it unites us. And then they were like, oh my God, <laughs> we're all together on the transcontinental. It's disgusting. And as a mixed race person, and I'm sure you <laughs> also as a mixed race person, like the fascination and the horror of that remains still about what is the biracial person and the biracial identity and body. That was the other place that I wanted to sort of write into. There's lots of sneaky ways in which I sort of point to sort of ideas of passing and ideas of mixing. And I make it explicit when I read, you know, write the poem in the voice of Suisun Farr, who was a biracial journalist who wrote about, you know, taking the train and, you know, you know, trying to fig figure out where she fit in. And she's a biracial woman writer at a time when that was really, really unusual. And, you know, the whole notes essay is all about obviously the history of America, but also the sort of story of my own family and the difficulty of sort of saying, can we unite East and West in these, in these ways? Um, so for me, it was about, and I even say this in the book, it's sort of like, you know, what is poetic? I elevate with fact and what is fact? Um, I change with poetry. And that, that was sort of the ethic that kind of ran through all of the work. It's a long answer to the question, but it's a really good question. It's a tough one. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Um, and you bring up, oh man, you bring up like four or five other things here that I kind of <laughs> want to get into. Um, I mean, I love the relationship of the notes section um, to the poems and, and the way that you're, uh, um, you know, the notes aren't just factual too. I mean, you feature in them emotionally also and and, and things, but but also that that how the kind of yin yang of poetry and fact and, and, and that, that you're kind of describing, if I can use that term. Um, uh, I also love this idea of, of that the, the railroad united East and West. Of course, that's both the East and West coast of the U.S. It's also Western and Eastern culture because of Chinese yeah. workers and this idea, I mean, that immediately invokes to me this idea of, of horizons and destinations as, as enfolding each other and constantly turning and, and it, which is also part of this communication thing too, you know, um, where's, where's that? There's some famous thought experiment about like, you know, you, you could take a map and you fold it. And now the two most distant places are, are yeah. right next to each other, right you know? Other. Yeah. yeah you know, one of, of thing. the things that I also, the reason, you know, biracial identity kind of functions this way, it goes in the book and just thinking about the way that the book itself divides between here are the poems that translate that Chinese character, those, that Chinese poem. And then here's the notes that then translate those poems into yeah. some other sort of historical research. And everything is a hybrid. Everything is, you know, combining two or more forms. And that is because in part, you know, that the Chinese poem in the Angel Island um, wall was, like I said, a dialogic pair. There were two, but I only translate one supposedly, yeah. but I wanted to effectively produce the presence of that missing other poem by always having two things mirror each other, the poems and the essays mirror each other. And then the book and the website actually sort of speak to, get to each other and they divide at several points too. Like the website has a couple of poems that don't appear in the book, vice versa. And obviously the book has the essays you can't get on the website, but you know, because of that, they also sort of speak to and then sort of don't necessarily mirror each other exactly. So I just see, I wanted to, I wanted to formally call back to as many ways as possible what that Chinese poem, that dialogic pair was doing in the walls of Angel Island as those two things faced each other and maybe united a meaning, an elegiac subject because you could read across them. And in that way, it did function a little bit like I think the transcontinental trying to unite two distinctly different <laughs> points of the map together. Um, so yeah, there's a method to this madness, but I admit <laughs> there's a lot of madness. <laughs> this is a totally insane project. <laughs> um, well, this is like, uh, I mean, it's it's wonderful. I mean, there's so there's just so many entry points, and there's so many, and, and again, again with the website, the nonlinearity of it, where where um, users, readers can can kind of navigate it according to their own will, their own animus. Um, but you know, this this words okay. So there's this question that I really like to ask in, in every one of these line breaks, and and I almost every other line break I ask it at the beginning of the line break. Um, I'm going to attempt to ask it here as we necessarily have to kind of start coming to a little bit of a close. Um, and, um, and I think it's because you are talking about your own authorship and, and also, but I'm going to frame it in this way too, which is that so much of what West is doing is it is cre it's creating this landscape. It is surveying this landscape that is 
that's three-dimensional and full of all these different people? And then how does an individual voice or an individual perspective kind of enter into that or how to, or exist within it or find their own, their own identity within it, you know? Um, and so that's kind of my question. So maybe we'll leave the project as now and look to the, your broader experiences as a whole, as, a, as an artist and as a writer. Um, and this is my great question, which is my predecessor, Laura's question, um, which is, can you go back to your own origins as a creative person and describe the first time that you recognized yourself in such a landscape, mm -hmm. in such a broad landscape, the, the entire landscape of art and literature? Um, was there a particular piece that resonated with you? Or when, do you, when did you first come alive as a poet? That's a good question too. And, and I know you sent me this question ahead of time and I've been sort of thinking about it. And there's many, many ways, but there's two I will only talk about. I think one was, I was a, uh, I started out as a medievalist <laughs> and um, I was at Trinity College. And this is gonna sound so woo woo. This is Trinity College in Dublin. And I was in the library and somehow I just, randomly pulled off the shelf um, an anthology of uh, medieval women's visionary literature. And it was just an anthology of these visions that different, you know, anchorites and nuns had had. Some they wrote down, some were taken down for them um, by confessors. And I just opened up and, and I just started reading and there was one by Mechtel von Magdeburg. And, and I just, I, I don't know why it startled me so much, but it really shocked me, partly because um, I had had a dream that was almost exactly like what she described. And I won't say what the dream was because I won't let it go too woo-woo-y, but, but I just be, remember being just so startled. I just thought, oh my God, how is this possible? And so I started reading that and that was, you know, just kind of sent me off into my medieval kick. Um, I'd been interested in sort of more of the Arthurian legends before that, but then that, after that, I was like, no, it's all medieval women's visionary literature. Um, so that was one, but then the second time it happened, I remember distinctly, I was also in graduate school and this time I was at the University of Michigan for my MFA. And, you know, this is probably not uncommon to a lot of people of color, you know, of a certain generation. Like I was always an avid reader and I love reading from all different corners of the world, that was never a problem, but no one had ever given me anything written by somebody who was biracial <laughs> um, at that point. Like I'd never gotten that in any of my classes. I hadn't even read passing, but you know, like for some reason it just never came into my, you know, whatever. And I remember standing at a, a counter, it was at Shame and Drum, this fantastic bookstore, and there was a book and it was just called Half and Half. And it just happened to be, literally just happened to be right by the cash register. And I looked at it and it just was like essays about being biracial and I just grabbed it. And I read it just in one sitting, I, you know, I was so excited. And then Danzy Senna's Caucasia, you know, was another one of those moments where I was like, oh, wow. <laughs> you know? um, I just, uh, so it was a completely different, you know, both those times it was very personally like a moment of recognition for, for totally different reasons. Um, but I will say just as a reader who loves to read in general, I think there are a thousand little moments where I feel some part of me open up in a book. Um, some part of me open up in a poem. With poetry, I think it was Rilke's Sonnets to Orpheus, which I remember reading and just, just loving, you know, and, it, you know, I felt the same way about, I got Inger Christensen's Alphabet and I just read it and I just, I just felt so like electric reading it. Um, and that doesn't have anything to do with a personal recognition of you know, something in me that I felt like hadn't been expressed, but it just felt like um, some part of my soul was also being expressed there. So yeah, I'm always in, I'm in search of that moment. Uh, so cool. I, I love this way you're kind of dropping these coordinates in, in these different places and, and where I feel the kind of the fruiting body, I'm going to use a mushroom uh, metaphor here, where it's <laughs> the, the, you, you know, Paisley Rectal's uh, fruiting bodies coming out in these different areas, like, you know, <laughs> Um, of creative, creative uh, body, but um, <laughs> the, uh, so, yeah, right. Uh, whatever. Um, I think I think everyone's origin story should start in the library in Trinity College. What a primordial, oh. dark, wonderful. Oh, I know it's so college. great. It was such a beautiful library too. I mean, the whole yeah. thing was just like it's like a Harry Potter kind of thing. You're just like, yeah. look at this. this. This is fantastic. 
Um, I, I very vividly remember the one the time I'd been there that uh, just seeing uh, Samuel Beckett's handwritten manuscripts, like just under oh. again museumification under a case, can't touch I it. I know, but yeah, incredible. But, yeah, oh, yeah. It's, just, it's there's something about the aura of the hand and you know being yeah. able to do that. You know. Um, well, thank you so much for sharing that with us. And I'm I'm so excited. We got to, man, we really could talk about some really <laughs> powerful and com complex. I mean, I I love, I mean, I love talking with you so much because your mind just moves in in, in such a textured ways and it's just really wonderful. Um and uh yeah, this has just been super fun for me. I hope it's been fun for you. Um, it's been so much fun. I could talk about the train for years. I mean, my husband yeah. and by the way, I don't know if you probably heard something kind of stumping around. That was my husband literally crawling on the floor to get his throat because he left it up here and he didn't want to get in the screen. So I don't know if you can edit that out or just leave that in. That's even better. I think it's great. Yeah. Um we should have, you know, it's uh we I think cats have been visitors and line break and things, but never husband. Um yeah, so um well that no that's so wonderful well do you um I'm, we, I'm looking here i got five minutes do you do you want to read another poem to take us to the end or uh, what do you what do you think yeah i will read one more poem and um this is something that you can't get off of the website i mean you, you can read it on the website but you can't hear how it's supposed to sound so one quick thing i'll say about this I wanted to think about people still riding the train illegally, like hobos, they used to call them, and now they call themselves riders, um, freight hoppers, basically. So I interviewed a number of people who have ridden the train illegally to create a portrait of maybe why and how um, people experience that. And um, it's important to hear the way it is read because I'm trying to mimic a particular sound. So. Dead is what they call a torn up track whose living rails I jump to bed down in the wells and feel the thud hit every trestle steam at dawn like horses at the track I trained them for the fillies foundered sick they fired the agents vets they fired the riders me I love how in a well you thrum with sound until your bare lips start to bleed like canisters of oil is stolen inside the train you'll find a nation what it wants to eat and where and what it likes to buy a ring a phone some jeans of horse there is no reason why to jump a train except to lose the edges of yourself the time like pacing moxie at the track that speed that almost tears your hands up at the wrist she was the last to go her tendon bowed and worthless than insurance no one rides a racehorse just for pleasure no one hops a train if they can take a plane a car whose engine speed is gauged by horses kept alive in memory for sentiment a guess is ghost of what we were and are we cannot bear to leave out in the desert where i'm going home just not right now i said of moxie not right now before the race she hasn't many left in her you know she trusts you right the owner said then slip me two grand and the shots so there you go <laughs> oh amazing a galloping paisley or oh, the trend the chugging oh wow that yeah. was so oh, that was great um also Flawless. That was amazing. Thank you. <laughs> um, Thank you. Oh, wow. Okay. That's great. That energizes me to, to get through the rest of the afternoon here. Um, <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much again. This was really fun and just and just just meaningful and so thought thought provoking um, and really, really enjoyed it. Um, well, thank so. you so much. And thank you for producing such a beautiful book. You know, I know it was such a lot of work and and I really love the finished product. I, for me, it's like a piece of art. So thank you. I really yeah, love it. Absolutely. Yeah. No. I, and, and we're just I mean, these are the galleys that, you know, we're going to see the the, um, the final final thing here in the spring. Um, so excited. And of course, the website. I'm so excited to see how these two interact out in the world um, when we get out there. So. And we'll do it. Um, so thank you, Paisley. Um, and thank you all out there for tuning in um, for this conversation and for all of our conversations. Um, it's been really special and meaningful for us at the press to have um, authors as amazing in this and projects that we get to bring out like this. So um, thank you all for being present to us. And we'll see you next time. <laughs>